Hey, it's an honor to be here today. It's really cool now that I'm traveling the country. I get to go to so many different state conventions and see all the different communities that there are in all the different states of all the libertarians. But here in Oklahoma, home of the Oklahoma caucus, and one of its roots. Does everybody here know what the Oklahoma caucus is? You better if you're in Oklahoma. I said, just because a lot of people don't know this. Is that, okay, I see a couple confused faces. Some people, uh, you gotta make this stuff official. Like this, this is what you really should have put in the bylaws today. Is that an Oklahoma caucus shall hereafter be known as a group of libertarians getting together to smoke marijuana at an official libertarian <laughs> event. Like that's gotta be codified somewhere by now. This is going back to 1972, people. And it was, it was awesome to hear Robert Murphy here today because he was, you know, being able to, to share that long-term historical perspective on the party and the movement, having been involved since 1979. But I, I like, I, when I travel, you know, people often invite me out to, to smoke weed, and, and, and I'll say, oh, you're having an Oklahoma caucus. And I go, what, what, what is that? You go, you don't know? So I'm doing my share to spread the esteemed historic culture of the Libertarian Party on this tour. And for those of you who didn't see the bus in the parking lot, Yes, I'm traveling the country running for the Libertarian Party nomination for president in 2020. Most importantly, bringing people back into the party who have been turned away in the past because we have had unprincipled candidates. And one of the things that's so exciting to see, you guys, you guys had a competitive, I mean, barely today, you had a competitive delegate selection process, right? 16 for 14 slots, and, and thank you to the two gracious first alternates for stepping up to, to accelerate that process. You know, that, was, that was very, very gracious of you. And I'm sure two people won't show up. You'll be, you'll be, if you want seats, I'm sure you'll get seats. But one of the things that's really unique this year in the history of the Libertarian Party is that on an off year, we're a little over a third of the way through convention season. So far, as far as I know, every single state except one has had a competitive delegate selection process. That is really exciting, because when I look at, if you go back, you look at, the, how many of you were at the 2016 National Convention when Gary Johnson and Bill Weld were nominated? Really, just one? Okay, well at least it's gonna be a few more hands when I come back next year for this, right? But there were uh, about 100 empty delegate seats at the start of the convention. And there were another 100 empty delegate seats at the end of convention season, out of about 1,000. Really rough numbers here. The way they were able to win the nomination, and I'm not saying there's any, anything underhanded about this on behalf of the Johnson campaign, they brought more people to the convention. They got them seated at the last minute. They filled in the empty delegate slots. The people like you, who have the energy and the initiative, who care enough about this movement and this party to show up to these meetings and sit through a whole day of Robert's Rules of Order. And by the way, congratulations on getting done early today. That was nice too. You get displaced when you don't show up by people who don't represent the party. What I have taken the most pride in what my team has accomplished in bringing more people into the party is the fact that we are bringing libertarians into the party to defend the statement of principles, to make sure that that is represented on the national stage. Whether it's by myself, I truly hope to have that honor, or anyone else. But what I'm most concerned with is that we get someone on that national stage in 2020 who's not going to endorse Hillary Clinton. Who's Is it kind of silly that we have to even put it in those terms and everybody knows what we're talking about? Now, there's one other thing that I'm, I'm really excited about seeing develop from the bottom up in the party right now, and that's a sense of unity. And in the past, the big debate, the big division in the libertarian movement has been, anybody? The Rose, no, 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 no. In the demographics within the libertarian party, what are the two big factions? Anarchists versus minarchists, right? Now, this is a really dumb, stupid, meaningless divide. And it becomes a semantic argument when you break it down. So I'm gonna break it down in case anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about here. The word anarchist means directly no rulers. Not no rules, not an organization. 
Anybody who's an anarchist, who's an honest anarchist, will say, of course you can come together on private property, of course you can create uh, an institution you can call it a government. I'm not going to put a gun to your head and say, no, you can't call your homeowners association a government, that's our word. Of course not, that's silly. And even, in, let's take the firearms position. And I think having done four months in jail for civil disobedience, I have a little bit of credibility to speak on this issue. The libertarian position is not pro-gun so much as it is pro-private property. I don't need a right to own a gun, I have a right to own property, and you don't have any right to tell me what property I can and cannot own, whether it's a gun or a crossbow or, or drugs or, or whatever else. If I'm not harming anybody, you don't have a right to tell me what I can and cannot do with my own property. <coughs> so if people wanted to come together, if you're anti-gun, this is where I think we lose trying to argue these issues as opposed to arguing pure principle, voluntarism, respect for property, respect for individual rights. If you're anti-gun and you want to say guns are not allowed on your property, I support your right to do that. I support your right to come together with a bunch of your neighbors and form a community where you say guns aren't allowed. I'm not going to live there, but you're welcome to do that. You're anti-drug, you want a community where drugs aren't allowed and people coming together on private property to, to come up with that as a voluntary agreement that we're all not going to allow drugs in this communal area that we all have a private property claim to legitimately. Fine, you can have a community where drugs aren't allowed. I'm not going to go to any of your parties, but that's cool, you can have that. So, if you're a minarchist, and you say, well, I only want government to do this, that, and the other. In a way, you're kind of falling into the status trap of even seeing it through the lens of government and imposing your aesthetics on what your concept of government is. Because this is not a political movement. This is an ethics movement. Right? Politics is a conversation of who do we point the guns of government at to organize society. And our answer is... Thank you. So... If you're a minarchist, you say, well, I only want government to do these things, but, oh yeah, of course I only want them to be voluntary. Well, you're an anarchist then, by that definition. So maybe you want to impose a different definition of anarchist, and anarchist means no government. Okay, well, that just means no institutions of coercion. It's a really stupid divide and debate because the real divide is not between anarchists and minarchists. The real divide is between people who don't agree on the basic ethical principles that this party is founded on and people like us who agree that the non-aggression principle is a darn good idea because really it comes down to just being a decent human being who respects your fellow humans on this earth. Holy crap! And we want to fight amongst each other over semantics? Who tricked us into that? Holy crap. If I was COINTELPRO of today and I was trying to make the Libertarian Party less effective, that's all I would be doing is making those arguments happen. It's time for us to unite under the principles of the party and the word libertarian. So if we can get to that point, we can unite not just the various splinter groups within the party, but we can unite left, right, and center against the common enemy that is big centralized government. We can unify people in this party without arguing what is the role of government, but what should the scope and the nature of government be. And I would say clearly, by any ethical analysis, it should be voluntary. But how do we achieve that? How do we make sure that everybody gets what they want? Because really, that's what this should be about. As libertarians, we, we tend. I, I, I love watching your uh, your, your chairs hand over of, of power today between <laughs> Tina and Aaron. Because neither of them wants this job. They're like, you know, screw this. Like it, it, it was just awesome hanging out with Tina outside talking about this. But even Aaron's like, Adam, you have to win in 2020 so that we don't. We, the Libertarian Party is the only one whose mission should be to put itself out of business. Right? We got we to do this. We got to handle this. And I think a lot of people get caught up in, in thinking that the struggle for freedom is going to last for generations. No. This is the mission of our generation to overcome this paradigm of statism entirely, once and for all. This is human progress. And we have a problem taking leadership. Because it's very much inherent in our personalities that we don't want to tell other people what to do, right? And, and sometimes, you know, we, we look down at other people for being followers. 
right? I always like to put my audiences on the spot at least a little bit, so I'll ask you all today. How many have designed the cut of the shirt you're wearing right now? Okay, normally there's one smart ass in the back. Well, I did. <laughs> so if I was given a, a talk on fashion and design, I could look down my nose at you guys and say, oh my gosh, you're all a bunch of followers. Well, for most human beings who are creatures of pragmatism, not philosophy and principle and all this other nerdy crap with politics that we get involved in, they don't care. They're rationally ignorant. In fact, we have come so far in humanity that well, most people are able to say, oh yeah, government just exists over there. Let's just say, well, we're, you know, I don't care if it takes half my income, i got a really good life. I'm not going to fight. We don't, have, we don't have to bleed for independence today. We don't have to have a revolutionary war. This can happen on the field of ideas. This is an evolution that's happening anyway. So how do we connect with them? I used to, you know, and, and I wrote a book when I was in jail, and I'll have uh, copies here for everybody tonight in the banquet, happy to sign them. I started writing this when I was in jail for civil disobedience to be the ultimate red pill. And because I had a lot of help polishing it, designing it, and everything else, I, I, I'm able to humbly say that we succeeded in this effort. By the way, really fun project I'm working on right now. This book, I always, I always like to ask people, how much do you think it costs me to get this book printed? And the answer is 40 cents. Yeah, free market to China, baby. Wow. 40 cents, I got 30,000 copies of these for $12,000 at our last printing. At the next scale, I can get them for 30 cents each. I can get them delivered like a catalog for 30 cents each. Which means to put 205,000 copies in every single residential mailbox in New Orleans right before the National Convention is only going to cost us $123,000. I've already raised about 90,000 of that. This is happening. We are taking the message directly to the people. So in the realm of politics, we need to be leaders. We need to step up and take charge and say, hey, you know what, it's time for the adults in the room to take over here. Because that's who we are compared to the Republicans and the Democrats, the childish criminals that they are. You talk about me. Absolutely. <laughs> Specifically you. <laughs> and one of the ways that we do this is unite people. You have to bring people together. You can't be a debate club if you want to be a political force. And the way you do that is to take charge and say, look, these are my principles. These are my guiding ideals. This is what I'm all about. These are my, my, my ethics, my standards. And this is how I apply them to make your life better immediately. And an important thing that comes to me from, from being a student of nonviolent communication by the way, I highly recommend that. If anybody wants to be a better communicator, this will change every relationship in your life. Nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg, especially important for libertarians. If we want to really take leadership, we have to understand who we're trying to lead. We have to listen. I've never heard on, on, on all my four years of touring an average voter come to me and say, you know what I really want out of politics? I want more philosophically consistent candidates. They don't care. You have to show them, and this doesn't mean compromise your principles. If anything, if you are confident in your principles, you stick to them, but you show them how they improve people's lives immediately. And this is what has led me to the conclusion that the future of our movement in terms of strategy and reality, how we get away from the status paradigm, is not by revolution, is not by overthrowing government, is not by a massive sudden paradigm shift where everybody goes tall. No, it's through localization of government. We don't have to argue about the role or the scope, just the geographic scale and the ethical nature. It should be voluntary, it should be as local as possible. And what I found traveling the country is that the, the most common thing I hear when I tell people I'm running for president on the platform of dissolving the federal government entirely is, you know, I, I hate the old parties and I don't usually vote, but I would come out to vote for that. And the reason is, it's the everybody gets what they want strategy. And really, if we want to be successful as a party, we have to separate our aesthetics 
from our ethics, what we want the world to look like, our preferences of a minarchist state in our community, or even like a local socialist thing in your in your hometown, or, or an absolute independent you know place where you can be totally sovereign and autonomous in your own private property, like where I am on 11 acres in Arizona. So I think this is critical to the future of the party, that we take charge, that we look at these bigger problems, that we, we stop trying to compromise our principles to be more pragmatic, because history has shown that there is nothing less pragmatic than compromising your principles. Principles are pragmatic. That's the point of having principles. So thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for listening to me today. I really, greatly appreciate everybody here who's making the party what it is, being involved, especially all of you who are stepping up to be delegates to the National Convention. It's going to be a very important year. And thank you for keeping this the party of principle. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at and we'll share it on my feed.